Welcome to the With You Rugby Podcast, designed to give you an in-depth look at the United States Rugby Foundation, including our grant programs and recipients, fundraisers, events, and much more. Now let's get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Vizard, President of the United States Rugby Foundation, and I want to welcome you to another one of our With You Rugby Podcast. And as we get closer to our 2024 U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame induction ceremony presented by Major League Rugby, which will take place at the historic Mayflower Hotel in Washington, D.C. on Saturday, July 13th, we thought it would be a good idea to get to know this year's Hall of Fame inductees and special award recipients just a little bit better. And today I am honored to welcome in a former player, coach, referee, USA and World Rugby instructor and course leader, and a 2024 U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame inductee, Nancy Fitz. Welcome, Nancy. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Brian. It's great to be here. And Nancy, where are, you, where are we talking to you from? Are you in your home, your office? Yeah, I'm in my, my home uh, in Falls Church, Virginia. Okay. As we do with all of our, our guests, uh, tell us a bit about your upbringing. Where did you grow up? What sports did you play as a kid? Uh, I grew up in a small town called Chagrin Falls, Ohio, uh, which is outside Cleveland. Um, I played pretty much any sport that I could. Um, back then, there weren't a whole lot of options. So I think it was co-ed, soccer, basketball, and um, softball uh, in the spring. And then got to middle school, added track and volleyball, um, and, and kind of went from there. Uh, my, my poor mom tried everything. She tried music. She tried uh, uh, art, uh, dancing, and all I wanted to do, to do was play sports. Yeah, fantastic. Well, in high school, you excelled at basketball and cross country. Tell me about your high school sports days and some of those accomplishments you had. Yeah, I, I was um, very lucky to to be on some really good teams. Um, you'll That'll be a bit of a theme throughout t this, this podcast. But my freshman year, I, I did cross country. Um, there were some really good seniors and juniors that ran cross country, and I, I was able to jump in with them, and we made it to the state championship really good basketball team made it to state championship and i i think it, we made it in the two mile relay in in track and field in the uh in the spring and i was like oh this is just what you do you go to state every year and i think i only made it like one or two more times uh the rest of my career so um basketball was definitely my main sport i played all four years cross country for a few years track for a few years i think softball for a, a season um but that basketball was really my main sport. Now, you, after high school, you went to Dartmouth College. Was that on a basketball scholarship? It was not on a scholarship. Uh, the, the IVs can't offer scholarships, but uh, I was recruited and it was Division One program. Um, basketball probably helped to get me in. Uh, people say that's not true, but um, I, I think it was back back then. Now, you had great success on the court at Dartmouth, and you helped lead the team to four Ivy League titles. Tell us about those glorious days for you and your teammates. Yeah, this is another one. Lucky to be on very four very good teams. Um, we had a, a good core of people, and we we managed to win the Ivies four years in a row, and they, they won the year after I graduated as well. So it was a, a, a really successful full run. Um, building on some great teams that came in like 82, 83. And um, we were we were just in the right place at the right time, um, had a good mix of shooters and tall rebounders. I was mostly a, a defender and, and a rebounder, which I, I guess was kind of a sign maybe I should play a different sport. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, and it, it, it's the contact part suited me well also. Were you, were you a center forward or? Uh, actually, a, a three, so sort of a tall wing, um, so small forward. And, and did but, Dartmouth make it to the dance at all? Did, did they? We didn't have an automatic bid back then. Uh, there were some rumblings that maybe we, we would get an NIT bid my senior year. Um, but I think the automatic bid came four or five years later. So okay. I, it's just an experience I never, never got to have. Yeah. Uh, it was at Dartmouth that you started playing rugby. Tell, tell me about how that came to be. Yeah, I after, after playing basketball all fall and winter of my freshman year, um, I found that I was not using my time wisely in the spring when I had all this freedom. And I was like, ah, okay, I need some structure. And uh, 
friend of one of my basketball teammates was like, oh, come play rugby. You'll love it. And I did. I, I, did. I went out on a one Thursday practice. Um, and I, I think I played in the seaside game that weekend and, and have been involved ever since. And uh, were you able to play rugby while you're playing basketball? They had no problem with that? Uh, two different questions. Um, I wasn't <laughs> able to play rugby uh, while I was playing basketball. The, the only overlap was in the fall. Um, and so I would play rugby for the first month of the, the semester. And then when basketball started my sophomore year, when there was a conflict, I went to rugby because it was more fun. Basketball coach was not pleased with that. Um, she told me I had to pick, choose one or the other. And I stewed on it for two or three days and I was like, I don't know what to do. And my a good friend of mine who was the captain went to the basketball coach and said, you're not going to like the decision she makes. So so we found a compromise that when there was a conflict, I went to basketball practices and the basketball team had to vote whether it was OK for me to miss Saturday basketball practices for rugby games. And of course they did. So oh, so we found we found a, a way to make it work. But um I don't think they were ever really happy about it. Yeah. Well, now you found uh, you had success on the basketball court. How did you fare in the college rugby rugby pitch? Uh, Dartmouth had a good team. Um, Deb Archambault really uh, developed that program. And she was a, a senior uh, co-captain when I was there. And I kept coming back and helping coach us. Um, and again, lucky to be on some really good teams. Uh, the class in, in front front of us had you know, but almost 10 really good players that were good leaders. So we did win some Ivy championships as well in rugby. Um, I think maybe soft, sophomore and senior year, I was actually off junior junior spring. So I missed that. But um, yeah, we, we, we um, and we had three sides pr pretty regularly. So that's pretty spectacular in the late 80s. Yeah, was it a popular sport on campus then? A lot of a lot of kids come by and watch. It was um, at least partly because they could drink beer while they watched. Uh, you know that that's that was part of the the culture, but um, it 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 was a club sport, um, and we kind of it, it's a, amazing that we managed to to do as well as we did. Deb coached part time when she could and when she was around, but other than that, the captains ran practices and. You know, you're limited by how much you you've learned as as a player. But um, we had, had a lot of really good athletes, and rugby was a little different then. I I feel like we 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 did a lot of running and pushing and running and pushing, and it it it's not as it wasn't as strategic as as it is now. I think. Yeah. So after Dartmouth, you relocated to Washington D.C., where you joined the D.C. Furies RFC. Were you looking to hook up with a rugby club and were there opportunities for you in basketball after your days at Dartmouth? Yeah, I really wasn't looking to to hook up with a rugby club. I, I actually didn't play my first two years here in D.C. Um, I, I did find a couple of basketball leagues to play in and um, but nothing, nothing serious, uh, just rec leagues in the in the evening. Um, but then I was watching a, a soccer tournament um, and a Emma Sheehan, who is now a good friend and a teammate, was we were sitting in the stands and she's like, what sports have you played? And I said, rugby. She's like, rugby. And she's like, I play for the Furies. You should come out. And she called me the day before the first practice that um, a couple months later. And I, I, I went out and I, was, I guess I was ready for it at that point. Yeah. Now, basketball's loss was rugby's gain. As you know, excelled on the pitch. You won several individual awards and team titles during your 15 years with the Furies. What are some of your fondest memories with the Furies that stand out in your mind? Yeah, this was, Brian, this was one of the hardest questions uh, to, to narrow things down. Um, I think we went on some great tours. Uh, my friend Kathleen McHugh is a great organizer and we went to France and Ireland. I think the team went to Australia. I wasn't able to go because it was during a World Cup year. Um, we went to South Africa and Argentina. So, so just the opportunity to to travel and and actually get to uh, enjoy the country and see something other than a rugby pitch and and the re the hotel and, and a restaurant or two was great. Um, but it, it really, when when I, I thought more about it, I think 
best times were just driving to games with friends and just laughing and talking the whole time, singing to the radio, because that was before I, iPods and all that. And um, just just the camaraderie and the, the good friends. Mm -hmm. in, in 1996, you made your debut with the Eagles. What do you remember about your, your first game with the, with the Red, White, and Blue? I just remember it was, uh, it was against Canada, up in Canada, and I just remember it being fast. I felt like all I did was spin around in circles. Um, I must have done something okay because they, they invited me back, but uh, I just felt like the whole game was just zooming past me. But well, they invited you back, all right. You had a six-year run with the Eagles, earning 21 caps at second row. Was there an Eagles match or two that stand out above the rest? <laughs> We did a tour, I think, in 97 um, to Australia, and we stopped in Fiji. Maybe this, yeah, no, I think it was the same tour. Um, so two very different experiences on that trip. One, we played in Suncor Stadium in Brisbane before an Australia-South Africa game. So that, I mean, just that was the first time I'd ever played in a stadium that big. And then to be able to sit there and watch um, watch Australia and South Africa was it was just a great experience and then on the way back we stopped in Fiji and it was almost the total opposite like as we were going to the um going to the field there's kids running around and with, with no shoes bare, you know barefoot playing rugby in in the streets and we played on this small um probably local park against Fiji and it, but that was just such a cool experience as well so kind of hitting those two extremes on the same tour was neat mm -hmm. uh, you played the 1998 and 2002 rugby world cups uh, where were those tournaments played and which of the two was your favorite and why so the 98 world cup was in Amsterdam and the 2002 was in Barcelona um I would say definitely the 98, um, multiple reasons. First, we we made it to the final. So anytime you play in a, in a World Cup final, that's that's a pretty cool experience. Um, I also was just a, a player. I just showed up and, and did my job. Um, in 2002, I was captain and you had to do a lot of troubleshooting and um, a meeting and mending fences and stuff like that. So. Uh, it, it was looking back, just being able to play, be a player, and, and focus on on my little corner of the the team was was pretty enjoyable. Well, let's talk about that '98 final. Who'd you play in the final, and uh, what do you remember about that game? We played New Zealand. Um, I think that was like right when they were coming on strong. Um, it again, just really fast paced. Um, I felt. Uh, I, w one of my strongest memories was uh, the, the Hakka. Um, and we, you know, we put, all put our arms around each other and we looked them in the eye and we we started uh, and we, we just kept creeping up and creeping up. And I think the refs actually had to kind of jump in to make sure uh, we didn't we didn't get too close. But um, they beat us pretty soundly in the in the end. But uh, number two is not so bad. Yeah. Yeah. Not great. And not too many second rows earned spots on the Eagles' sevens teams. Uh, yeah, you played on the Eagles' first sevens team in 1997, again in 1999. What did you like most about the sevens game, and was there a memory or two that you remember from your time with the Eagles' sevens? Yeah, I, I love sevens. Um, I, I think there's a lot of translations from basketball to sevens in terms of reading space and committing defenders, playing zone defenses. So that was actually a, a very natural progression. Um, Memories, I, I, it was actually pre-Eagles, but in 1996, Amal Cygnus took an organized an Atlantis team and really organized other, got other countries to put like pseudo national teams into a tournament in Hong Kong. Um, so that was, that was actually where I got seen and got invited to 15s. Um, but at that tournament, so we flew to Hong Kong, we we're going to play in this tournament in a stadium, not the big Hong Kong Stadium, um, but they had torrential rain and the um, they wouldn't let us play on that field. And we're like, oh, great. We just spent all this money to come to Hong Kong to not play. 
and there was like a school field on the side that we ended up playing on with no goalposts, but, but we got the tournament in and we got, we got to play. So um, I, I, I do think that was probably like what led to, that was kind of proof that yeah, women can play sevens and that led to it being included in Hong Kong sevens the next year. Oh, good, good. Now, as your playing career was winding down, you started to coach. Did you know that you were going to go into coaching after playing? Or did that, and how did that first coaching opportunity come about? Yeah, I think it was a natural progression. Um, as captain of the Furies for a pretty long time, I ended up doing a, a fair amount of coaching. Like when we would split forwards backs, I'd often work with the forwards. So I, I knew it was, it was just kind of, um, it was going to happen. Uh, I think first official, I might have been helping coach the um, Mid Atlantic All Stars um, at that point, and then also um, as assistant coach at the Naval Academy. I was actually still playing at that point. Um, so, but I got there once a week. Um, well, you coached a number of teams, the Furies, Georgetown, the Naval Academy, Nova, Mid-Atlantic, Capital All-Stars. I guess that the first thing that comes to mind is how did you find the time to coach all those teams? And hopefully they were spaced out over a period of time. Yeah, they were definitely spaced out over a period of time. Um, yeah, I teams always rugby t needs coaches. Um, so I, I sometimes have a hard time saying no when people ask me to do things. So um that's that's how i've gotten into many of those um i i have said i'm 15s coaching club 15s is such a big commitment um i kind of haven't done that since 26 or 2010 um so the select side is kind of a short season uh and opposite s summer seven so i usually try to do so far recently i've been doing things that aren't a huge commitment um but still keeps me involved um, and just uh, wanting to give back. I mean, rugby's given me a lot of great opportunities and if I can help other people uh, learn the sport and get s some of the same things, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Is there a moment or two that uh, from your coaching career that brings a smile to your face? Yeah, that's such a, another tough one. Um, I loved coaching Georgetown um, in the, that's what I did when I, I stopped playing and took my first first dive into full-time coaching. Um, just such a great group and they absorbed information. Um, I We did this uh, interval training. So we were out in the dark running on the football field on Tuesday and Thursday nights through the winter and they all did it. Um, we didn't quite make it to nationals that year, but we, we lost in the regional finals. Um, so th those are very fun memories. And while you were coaching, you took up a refereeing uh, club, college, and high school games in the Potomac area. What or who inspired you to give back to the game with a whistle? Yeah, that we were really short on refs um, back in the day, and you know that the referee society was making pleas. You know, if if we don't have refs, we can't have rugby games. Which so kind of the same thing, trying to trying to help help grow the game. Um, Probably roughing was the the least uh, uh, storied of my uh, r rugby rugby ex exploits, um, but I I it's it's hard, man. It's really hard, uh, and and I I did it. I probably should have once I stopped playing, gone right into roughing. But by the time I started roughing, I was already mid forties and had trouble keeping up with. Uh, adult adults um then college and then when i couldn't keep up with the high school kids anymore and i didn't want to be one of those refs who was calling the game from 20 meters back so uh yeah. that was it was time to time to move on from that now you currently are a usa and world rugby coach instructor and course leader tell me about what you do in those roles and how did those opportunities come about yeah, so uh, that what that involves is running the coaching courses, um, which have gone through varying uh, different versions over time. Um, but there's sort of a, the level one is an introductory coaching ex one day experience. And then the level two is a, a little more intense two day with more homework. Um, so it's a really cool opportunity to work with coaches and help um, again, help grow the game, help 
players who are are making that transition from player to coach, you know, take the things that are in their head and that they know how to do physically and and how teach them, help them how learn how to explain that and, and teach that to, to their players. Um, I got into it. I was actually still playing. I wasn't coaching when when I was asked to do it. Pete Steinberg was running the program. And I'm going to say this half jokingly, but I, I think there's a, a fair amount of truth to it. He needed some women and he needed people with an American accent. Um, so again, he asked and I was like, oh, OK, I'll do it. Um, and that was back in the day when it, the, the courses weren't practical. You sat in a room and you know gave lectures with um, it was before PowerPoint, so there were those clear plastic slides. Um, so it's it's they're much better now. Much more actual coaching goes on during the courses. But yeah, that, I started that the late late nineties, I think. Yeah. In 2023, just last year, you're one of the first recipients of the Kathy Flores Lifetime Achievement Award. You now join Kathy in the U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame. What did winning that award mean to you? Yeah, um, a, a lot. Um, I I had so much respect for Kathy as as a player. Um, I was a couple of years behind her and played with her at, on the East um, as a coach. She was just so successful, and and her teams just did so well. And I, I liked. I loved her demeanor. I, I learned a lot from watching her. And then as a person, she was just just amazing. So so to be uh, included in the same sentence as Kathy Flores is, is, is an honor in and of itself. And then the other people that were inducted that year were um, folks that I had, had played with and played against and coached, been coached by, coached against, and just a lot of people that I, I really respect and uh, am honored to be included in that in that group. That's great. And Nancy, you were a player, a coach, a referee, instructor, course leader. Of all your rug rugby memories and accomplishments, is there one or two that stand above the rest? I'm, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty proud of how the the Furies kind of hung in there and improved over, over the course of the 15 years, which was not just me. We had a lot of good coaches. And a lot of other good players, like Jen Rennie was also on the Eagles, um, and a lot of good young talent. But DC is a pretty transitional place, and we'd have like half of the team change over every year. Um, but over time, we we kind of went from being like barely making it to nationals to being pretty solidly in that that uh, probably what nine to twelve range. Um, and, and occasionally competing with with the big dogs above us. So I, I'm, I'm proud of that. And I, I'd like to think that um, a lot of people thought I was a good teammate. Um, and that's that's probably more, that's more important to me than, than being a good rugby player. Yeah, I'm not sure if this is gonna be a different answer, but looking back on your rugby career, what are you most proud of? Yeah, kind of, kind of the same thing. I guess I combined the answers for, for those questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, one final question, what does being selected to the U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame mean to you? Yeah, it's hard to put that in words, Brian. Um, I'm just so honored and surprised and, and grateful to be uh, considered and, and for you to um, give me the opportunity to, to be inducted. Um, and I appreciate being in with the group of people that, that are being inducted. Again, a lot of great players, administrators, um, Jamie Jordan was also in that first class of Kathy Flores lifetime recipients. Um, and she was running the Eagles when I, I started. Uh, Lee Kelly has done so much for Gonzaga and just rugby and in, in DC in general. We always had coaching courses at Gonzaga. If you needed something, Lee would Lee, Lee would make it happen. Um, and that's just a few of, of the people. I could go all the way down the list, um, but very, very grateful and very honored. Well, very well deserved as well, Nancy. And uh, yeah, that's a great class. And I look forward to congratulating you in person at the Mayflower on July 13th. And uh, thanks for taking the time today. It's been a it's been a real fun journey following you through your career. Thank you. Well, folks, that's going to do it for this edition of our With You Rugby podcast. For more information about the U.S. Rugby Hall of Fame, go to our website at usrugbyfoundation.org. In the upper right hand column, click on Hall of Fame. Until next time, everyone, stay safe.